March 21st. We begin our Bible reading today as usual in the Old Testament first, and our narrative today will come from the book of Numbers, chapter 32, verse 1. We'll go through chapter 33 and verse 39. They assured Moses that they would help conquer the land, but the tribes still brought division to Israel. In fact, when the land was fully conquered, the two and a half tribes had to put up an altar to let people know we belong to Israel. Had they gone over the Jordan and claimed their inheritance, well, everybody would have known their citizenship. Do not take us over the Jordan, it says in verse 5, is as much as an expression of failure as take us back to the land of Egypt. Same attitude. Or let us die in the wilderness. Same attitude. Attitude of defeat. And uh, retreat. When material gain, not the glory of God, governs our decisions, we will make the wrong decisions and live in the wrong neighborhood, so to speak. It's good to review the past and discern the hand of the Lord at work. God delivered them from Egypt and brought them to Sinai, where they entered into a covenant with Him. Then He brought them to the border of the Promised Land, where they refused to go in. These were a stubborn and stiff-necked people. They wandered as a result for forty years, needlessly actually, and then ended up on the plains of Moab. Well, the principle here is this, my friend. Unbelief means wasted time, wasted lives, and wasted opportunities. But God is gracious and long-suffering with His people. Well, with that, let's begin our reading today here in the Old Testament. March 21st, Numbers chapter 32, verse 1, through chapter 33, verse 39. Now the tribes of Reuben and Gad owned vast numbers of livestock. So when they saw that the lands of Jazer and Gilead were ideally suited for their flocks and herds, they came to Moses, Eleazar the priest, and the other leaders of the people. They said, Ataroth, Dibon, Jazer, Nimrah, Heshbon, Elielah, Sebam, Nebo, and Beon, the Lord has conquered this whole area for the people of Israel. It is ideally suited for all our flocks and herds. If we have found favor with you, please let us have this land as our property, instead of giving us land across the Jordan River. Do you mean you want to stay back here while your brothers go across and do all the fighting? Moses asked the Reubenites and Gadites. Are you trying to discourage the rest of the people of Israel from going across to the land the Lord has given them? This is what your ancestors did when I sent them from Kadosh Barnea to explore the land. After they went up to the valley of Eskol and scouted the land, they discouraged the people of Israel from entering the land the Lord was giving them. Then the Lord was furious with them, and He vowed, Of all those I rescued from Egypt, no one who is twenty years old or older will ever see the land I solemnly promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for they have not obeyed me completely. The only exceptions are Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Kenizzite, and Joshua, son of Nun, for they have wholeheartedly followed the Lord. The Lord was furious with Israel, and made them wander in the wilderness for forty years, until the whole generation that sinned against Him had died. But here you are, a brood of sinners, doing exactly the same thing. You are making the Lord even angrier with Israel." If you turn away from him like this, and he abandons them again in the wilderness, you will be responsible for destroying this entire nation. But they responded to Moses, We simply want to build sheepfolds for our flocks and fortified cities for our wives and children. Then we will arm ourselves and lead our fellow Israelites into battle until we have brought them safely to their inheritance. Meanwhile, our families will stay in the fortified cities we build here, so they will be safe from any attacks by the local people. We will not return to our homes until all the people of Israel have received their inheritance of land. But we do not want any of the land on the other side of the Jordan. We would rather live here on the east side, 
where we have received our inheritance. Then Moses said, If you keep your word and arm yourselves for the Lord's battles, and if your troops cross the Jordan until the Lord has driven out his enemies, then you may return when the land is finally subdued before the Lord. You will have discharged your duty to the Lord and to the rest of the people of Israel, and the land on the east side of the Jordan will be your inheritance from the Lord. But if you fail to keep your word, then you will have sinned against the Lord, and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Go ahead and build towns for your families and sheepfolds for your flocks, but do everything you have said. Then the people of Gad and Reuben replied, We are your servants and will follow your instructions exactly. Our children, wives, flocks, and cattle will stay here in the towns of Gilead. But, sir, all who are able to bear arms will cross over to fight for the Lord, just as you have said. So Moses gave orders to Eleazar, Joshua, and the tribal leaders of Israel. He said, If all the men of Gad and Reuben, who are able to fight the Lord's battles, cross the Jordan with you, then, when the land is conquered, you must give them the land of Gilead as their property. But if they refuse to cross over and march ahead of you, then they must accept land with the rest of you in the land of Canaan. The tribes of Gad and Reuben said again, Sir, we will do as the Lord has commanded. We will cross the Jordan into Canaan, fully armed to fight for the Lord. But our inheritance of land will be here on this side of the Jordan. So Moses assigned the tribes of Gad, Reuben, and half the tribe of Manasseh, son of Joseph, the territory of King Sion of the Amorites, and the land of King Og of Bashan, the whole land with its towns and surrounding lands. The people of Gad built the towns of Dibon, Ataroth, Arorur, Atroth Shofan, Jazer, Jogbeha, Beth Nimrah, and Beth Haran. These were all fortified cities with sheepfolds for their flocks. The people of Reuben built the towns of Heshbon, Aliala, Kiriathaim, Nebo, Balmion, and Sibma. They changed the names of some of the towns they conquered and rebuilt. Then the descendants of Makur of the tribe of Manasseh went to Gilead and conquered it, and they drove out the Amorites who were living there. So Moses gave Gilead to the Makurites, descendants of Manasseh, and they lived there. The people of Jair, another clan of the tribe of Manasseh, captured many of the towns in Gilead and changed the name of that region to the towns of Jair. Meanwhile, a man named Noba captured the town of Kenath and its surrounding villages, and he renamed that area Noba after himself. This is the itinerary the Israelites followed as they marched out of Egypt under the leadership of Moses and Aaron. At the Lord's direction, Moses kept a written record of their progress. These are the stages of their march, identified by the different places they stopped along the way. They set out from the city of Ramesses on the morning after the first Passover celebration in early spring. The people of Israel left defiantly in full view of all the Egyptians. Meanwhile, the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn sons, whom the Lord had killed the night before. The Lord had defeated the gods of Egypt that night with great acts of judgment. After leaving Ramesses, the Israelites set up camp at Sukkoth, and they left Sukkoth and camped at Etham, at the edge of the wilderness. They left Etham, and turned back toward Pihiroth, opposite baal Zephon, and camped near Migdal. They left Pihiroth and crossed the Red Sea into the wilderness beyond. Then they traveled for three days into the Etham wilderness and camped at Mara. They left Mara and camped at Elam, where there are twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees. They left Elam and camped beside the Red Sea, they left the Red Sea and camped in the Sin Desert. They left the Sin Desert and camped at Dofka. They left Dofka 
and camped at Elush. They left Elush and camped at Rephidim, where there was no water for the people to drink. They left Rephidim and camped in the wilderness of Sinai. They left the wilderness of Sinai and camped at Kibroth Hataava. They left Kibroth Hataava and camped at Hazaroth. They left Hazaroth and camped at Rithma. They left Rithma and camped at Rimon Perez. They left Rimon Perez and camped at Libna. They left Libna and camped at Risa. They left Risa and camped at Kehilatha. They left Kehilatha and camped at Mount Shefer. They left Mount Shefer and camped at Harada. They left Harada and camped at Makilath. They left Makilath and camped at Tahath. They left Tahath and camped at Tira. They left Tira and camped at Mithka. They left Mithka and camped at Hashmona. They left Hashmona and camped at Moziroth. They left Moziroth and camped at Bnei Jahakan. They left Bnei Jahakan and camped at Hor Hagidgad. They left Hor Hagidgad and camped at Jatbatha. They left Jatbatha and camped at Abrona. They left Abrona and camped at Azion Geber. They left Azion Geber and camped at Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin. They left Kadesh and camped at Mount Hor at the border of Edom. While they were at the foot of Mount Hor, Aaron the priest was directed by the Lord to go up to the mountain, and there he died. This happened on a day in midsummer, during the fortieth year after Israel's departure from Egypt. Aaron was 123 years old when he died there on Mount Hor. March 21st. Our Bible reading today in the New Testament will come from the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 31, and we'll go through chapter 5, verse 11. Here in the book of Luke, chapter 4, beginning at verse 31, we'll read about the healer. You know, Jesus fulfilled his commission by bringing healing and deliverance to the poor and needy by the authority of his word. Had he not overcome the devil privately, well, Jesus could not have defeated him publicly. Same is true in our lives. While the preaching of the word was his major ministry, Jesus had compassion on the sick and he healed them. We may not have the power to heal, but he does. And we can comfort and assist those who are needy. And we can do it all in Jesus' name. You know, Jesus responds to submission. It's not enough to believe in God. People say, oh yes, I believe in the Lord. Well, that's not really the question. The question is, who is Jesus Christ to you? Is he your Lord? Do you bow to him? Do you submit your will, the totality of your life, to the Lordship of Christ? That's the real question. Now, if you had fished all night and caught nothing, would you be getting ready to go fishing again, go out there and try it again? Well, one reason Jesus called several fishermen to be his disciples was that they never quit. Peter may have thought he knew more about fishing than Jesus did, but he did what Jesus commanded, and the Lord honored his obedient faith. See, no failure is final if you come to the Lord for a new start. And now let's begin our reading today here in the New Testament. March 21st, Luke chapter 4, verse 31, through chapter 5, verse 11. Then Jesus went to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and taught there in the synagogue every Sabbath day. There, too, the people were amazed at the things he said, because he spoke with authority. Once, when he was in the synagogue, a man possessed by a demon began shouting at Jesus, "'Go away! Why are you bothering us, Jesus of Nazareth?' Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One sent from God. Jesus cut him short. Be silent, he told the demon. Come out of the man. The demon threw the man to the floor as the crowd watched. Then it left him without hurting him further. Amazed, the people exclaimed, What authority and power this man's words possess! Even evil spirits obey him and flee at his command. 
The story of what he had done spread like wildfire throughout the whole region. After leaving the synagogue that day, Jesus went to Simon's home, where he found Simon's mother-in-law very sick with a high fever. Please heal her, everyone begged. Standing at her bedside, he spoke to the fever, rebuking it, and immediately her temperature returned to normal. She got up at once and prepared a meal for them. As the sun went down that evening, people throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus. No matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed every one. Some were possessed by demons, and the demons came out at his command, shouting, You are the Son of God! But because they knew he was the Messiah, he stopped them and told them to be silent. Early the next morning, Jesus went out into the wilderness. The crowds searched everywhere for him, and when they finally found him, they begged him not to leave them. But he replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other places too, because that is why I was sent. So he continued to travel around, preaching in synagogues throughout Judea. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it is deeper, and let down your nets, and you will catch many fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, we'll try again. And this time... Their nets were so full, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, "'Oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you.' For he was awestruck by the size of their catch, as were the others with him. His partners, James and John— the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Psalm 64, verses 1 through 10. We'll read about David's fear of the enemy here in this psalm today. You know, the king asked to be preserved, not from the enemy, but from the fear of the enemy. Fear and faith cannot live in the same heart. If the enemy can make you afraid, well, he has almost won the battle. You see, a calm heart makes a confident soldier. We'll read about the enemy's fear of nothing. They do not fear, says in verse 4. Uh, their words are like swords and arrows, David wrote. And they said hidden traps. It looks like David is defeated. But then read on. The fear of the Lord, but God. Two of my favorite words in Scripture, but God. He's the turning point in the story. He's always the turning point in our story as well. Because when the enemy least expects it, God shoots at them. And guess what? <laughs> God hits his target every time. God is the perfect archer. And they fall into their own traps. All men shall fear, and the righteous be glad. Psalm chapter 64, verses 1 through 10. For the choir director, a psalm of David. O oh God, listen to my complaint. Do not let my enemies' threats overwhelm me. Protect me from the plots of the wicked, from the scheming of those who do evil. Sharp tongues are the swords they wield, bitter words are the arrows they aim. They shoot from ambush at the innocent, attacking suddenly and fearlessly. They encourage each other to do evil and plan how to set their traps. Who will ever notice, they ask. As they plot their crimes, they say, We have devised the perfect plan. Yes, the human heart and mind are cunning, 
but God Himself will shoot them down. Suddenly His arrows will pierce them. Their own words will be turned against them, destroying them. All who see it happening will shake their heads in scorn. Then everyone will stand in awe, proclaiming the mighty acts of God, realizing all the amazing things He does. The godly will rejoice in the Lord and find shelter in Him. And those who do what is right will praise Him. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 22. A woman who is beautiful but lacks discretion is like a gold ring in a pig's snout.